coming up on The Golden Key. What do you think special about St. Martin de Porres? Well, he was black, right? Claire! Yeah, wait, what? You're saying there was an African pope? At least three that we know of. Hey, you slaves, stop! Lord, keep us safe. Alright guys, that's it for class today. God bless you, and see you next week. Hey Peter and Ben, how was CCD class? Hey Veronica, good. Mr. Robinson always keeps it interesting. Hi Claire, how was your class? Hey Peter, Veronica, class was good. Hi Ben. Hey Pete. Hey Veronica, Claire, how are you guys? Good. good. Okay. Hey, who's all that medal you're wearing? Hmm? Oh, that's St. Martin de Porres. Oh yeah, he was from Peru, right? Yep, that's him. You know, you all, I'm just wondering, what do you think special about St. Martin de Porres? I don't know that much about him. He was holy, right? And didn't he like animals and stuff and heal people? Well, he was black, right? Claire! What? It's true. It is true. Do you think it offends me for her to say that because I'm black? I mean, I'm glad we have a black saint to think about. Ask for an accessory prayer or all that. That is cool. Kind of like a tear to Ketkosla, the first Native American saint. Yeah, but, well, that's just it. How many other black saints do you know about? Now wait, there's the Ugandan martyrs, that's several. Yeah, I guess that is true. Hey guys, did I hear someone mention the Ugandan martyrs just now? Yeah, well, we were just talking about, well, black saints and Native Americans and stuff. Ah, okay. That's a very interesting subject. Ben, you look a little down, my friend. What's happening? Yeah, well, I mean, my family's Catholic, of course. Have been all my life. But I've got a cousin, he's, you know, not Catholic. Hmm, does he hassle you about your faith? Well, it's not like the usual stuff, you know. You guys worship Mary or whatever. He's not really Protestant as much as he's, well, just not really Christian. He says the Catholic Church is just all white and always has been. And it did all these bad things to non-white people and only recently added a few black or native or Hispanic saints just so the church wouldn't look bad. Yeah, but there's tons of Catholics who aren't white. I mean, there's not a lot of black Catholics in our parish, but lots of Hispanic people. I know there are a lot of Catholics in Africa who are black. There must be tons of saints from there. That's just it. I don't really know any. I mean, I love my faith, and it's way, way more international than most any other churches and all. With so many Catholics in South America and Mexico, like you said, and I know there are a bunch in Asia too. I don't know. I just, I don't know what to say to him. Well, you all picked a great time to discuss this. How so, Mr. Robinson? Well... It just so happens that we have a visiting priest here who's from Africa. I've known him for a long time, actually, and I happen to know he knows a lot about the history of Christians and Catholics in Africa and other places in that part of the world. Maybe you remember him from his past visit. Father Tad? Yeah, I do remember him. Yeah, he was nice. Always so positive and friendly. Well, if you have a few minutes, I'm sure he'd be glad to talk with you. He's in the rectory now, I'll just give him a quick call and see if he has time. Welcome. Welcome, all of you. It is nice to see you again, my friend. Father, thanks for meeting with us. How are you? I am well. And how are the children today? Good. Fine. Very good. Please come sit down and let us discuss your questions. So, young man. What is your name? Ben. Ben. I understand you have questions. Maybe what might be called concerns about the history of our church when it comes to people of color like myself and yourself. Yes, Father. My cousin says the Catholic Church is the white man's church and Christianity in general is the white man's religion. (laughs) Well, Ben. 
I am sure you know how very many black, brown, Asian, Native American, and other groups around the world today are Catholic. In fact, in the whole world, more people of those parts of the world are practicing their Catholic faith, some might argue, than people of European descent. Is that true? It is. And it is true that 500 and more years ago, many Catholics lived in Europe. The majority, I think it's safe to say. But that really was more recent than the earliest years of the church. Really? Indeed, my friend. Let's look at where Christianity began. Much of it's in what we today call the Middle East. Think of the Old and New Testaments. Many of the stories in them took place in countries like modern-day Iraq, Syria, Israel, Egypt. Do you think of those places as being just European people with blonde hair and blue eyes? What do you say, Peter? I don't. Not at all. Right. And in many cases, those places were port cities or on trade routes, so people from many nationalities and ethnicities populated them, including Greeks and Eastern Europeans, Asians and of course, Middle Easterners and North Africans. That is the geographic context for much of the Bible. Father, my cousin says even if there's an African Pope someday, he still won't change his mind about the church. I hope it happens one day before too long. That would be nice. Well, Ben, I hope we can assess our Holy Father by his holiness of character more than his place of birth or color or skin. But an African Pope would be nice. It's been some years since we had one. Yeah, wait, what? You're saying there was an African Pope? Yes, at least three that we know of. Seriously? When was that? Well, the first black pope was from Africa in the year 189. His name was Victor, now Saint Victor. He especially worked to see that the teaching of our Lord, handed down by the apostles, were preserved free from any mistakes. Pope Victor condemned those teaching false doctrine and told all Christians to have nothing to do with them. While Saint Victor was pope, a dispute arose in the church about exactly which date to keep the Feast of Easter. St. Victor called a meeting of all the bishops who could get to Rome. The result was that Easter was fixed for the Sunday following the 14th day, against the custom of the churches in Asia, and it has remained so ever since. St. Victor made Latin the official language of the church. He died about the year 200. No way, that's so cool. He was an important pope then. Indeed he was. Another black pope was Saint Melchiades, who was elected pope in the year 311. He was also born in Africa. The year after his election, a very important event changed the course of not only Christian history, but world history. Under the Roman Emperor Constantine, the church began to live at peace after all the years of persecution, and St. Melchiades was the first pope to witness that. He died in the year 314. St. Gelasius was born in Rome, but was part of an African family, and he became pope in the year 492. His pontificate lasted less than five years. But during that time, he did a great deal of good for the church. St. Gelasius wrote letters and books and hymns and was known throughout the church as a very learned and holy pope. I understand, Father. I don't know that this will, you know, convince him, but I do think he should know about it. I think you're right, Ben. There were many other early African Christians and saints, you know. One was St. Moses who lived in the 4th century. He became leader of a band of robbers near Egypt until people rose up and drove the robbers away. Moses escaped to the desert of Skit 
a very wild spot where only hermits lived. These holy men lived alone and spent their days in prayer. The holiness, humility, charity and love of the monks had a profound effect on him and he decided he would stay with them. As the years passed, Moses grew closer to God till he could think of nothing but God's goodness and how he could repay it by doing good to everyone. Moses did die a martyr in one of the persecutions of the church and became a saint. Were there other African saints, Father Tad? So many. Like the 6th century Ethiopian, Saint Elisban, a king who put himself at the head of his armies in battle against a man who killed some 4,000 Christians in the area. King Elisban defeated the army and restored the captured cities, building a beautiful church to honor the Christian martyrs. But the king realized he had been sinfully cruel to his defeated enemies and not kept the laws of God. He decided to give up his throne and spend the rest of his life doing penance. He appointed his son king and left for the wilderness, much like Saint Moses. Who else, Father? Well, to name a few, the great Matar saints Perpetua and Felicity were from Carthage, North Africa. Perpetua's diary of her imprisonment is one of the earliest writings by a woman about her life and the story of a martyrdom written by a fellow Christian is one of the earliest first-hand accounts of martyrdom. And no less than three of the 35 doctors of the church were from Africa. The three are Augustine of Hippo, which is present-day Algeria, Athanasius of Alexandria, and Cyril of Alexandria, both from Egypt. Saint Athanasius is famous as the bishop who put together the first complete list of books in the New Testament of the Bible, in the middle 300s AD. Of course, a church council had to make that list official to give us the Bible we now have, but his list was the first one to match ours. Saint Cyril and Augustine were great church fathers. Augustine, along with St. Thomas Aquinas, is considered to be one of the greatest philosophers in all of Christian history. His writings, especially his book, Confessions, which tells of his conversion, are read by many non-Christians in universities, and he is loved by Protestant and Catholic Christians. To name just a few of the early writers and theologians who had connections with Africa, there was Saint Mark the Evangelist, author of the Gospel of Mark and founder of the Patriarchate of Alexandria, Saint Clement of Alexandria, Saint Cyprian of Carthage, Saint Isidore of Pelusium, and others. Later African saints include Saint Gebr Michael, who was born in 1791 in Ethiopia, who helped spread the Catholic faith in that country and eventually died from his tortures for doing so. There was Saint Benedict de Moor, a former slave in the 1500s, who became a Franciscan, regarded for his holiness and wisdom. You may know of Saint Martin de Paul's, perhaps the most famous black saint today, he was a Dominican who helped heal the sick and even made friends with many animals. He was a very holy man and loved by so many, who were inspired by his own holiness and devotion. And of course, the Metars of Uganda in Africa are more recent African saints. Yeah, I know they die for their faith, of course, but I don't know that much about them. Well, the European explorer Stanley is credited with being the first European to enter Uganda. And soon after, the Pope sent missionaries there to teach the Catholic faith. The king at the time, King Mutesa, was a kind man who allowed the teaching and many of his people became Catholics. But after he died came a very bad king named Muanga. The king was not satisfied until he had killed about 100 brave Christians. 
This was on Easter Sunday, 1886, five years after the missionaries had come to Uganda and baptized the first person there. On June 6, 1920, Pope Benedict XV selected 22 out of the 100 whose names were known and declared them martyrs of the faith. They are called the martyrs of Uganda. Wow. So you see, friends, there have been many holy saints of Africa, and do you know there are many more now? In recent years, hundreds of thousands of Christians have been martyred across the world. In fact, there are more martyrs in the last decades than in the great persecution of Christianity in the early centuries of the church. Can you believe that? Really? Yes, Claire. And by no means are all of them African. But some certainly are, and many are persons of color. In many ways, Christianity and Catholicism are becoming smaller and smaller in much of Europe. But they are exploding in Africa, parts of Asia, and South and Central America. Many Africans today are Catholic, and many are bringing their faith to parts of America to help serve the church. That is partly because fewer people take vows to the priesthood in America today. Fewer people with their ears open to God's voice inviting them to that calling. And so, priests like me, journeying here from Africa as our bishops make arrangements with American bishops, are continuing to show that the Catholic faith is truly international and is not only not the white man's religion, as your cousin suggests, Ben, but is a faith practiced by people of every ethnicity. And now, friends, I have an appointment in a few minutes. But may God our Father bless each one of you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I am so glad you came to see me. Let us talk again before too long, okay? You know, kids, if you have a minute, I also wanted to tell you about a very holy man of African descent whose story is a lot closer to home for all of us. What saint is that, Mr. Robinson? Well, Claire, he's actually not a saint. Not yet, anyway. Though his case for sainthood is coming along. He's Father Augustus Tolton, and he was the very first known African-American man to be ordained a priest in the United States. I heard about him, but I don't know much. It's quite a story. See, he was born in 1854 in the state of Missouri, which, if you know much about American history, means he and his family were slaves. Now his father, Peter Paul Tolton, escaped and joined the Union Army. Because what war was happening around that time? The Civil War up to 1865. That's right, Veronica. And sadly, Augustus Tolton's father died while serving in the Union Army. His mother, Martha, made a brave decision. One night, she and little Augustus, along with his brother Charlie and sister Anne, made a brave and daring move. Children, whatever you do, stay quiet, please. Now, now, don't cry. I've been asking our Lord to protect and guide us, and I know he's with us. Just keep praying. Just, Lord, give me strength to keep rowing this boat across, clear across the Mississippi. There they are. Get them. Hey, you slaves, stop. Lord, keep us safe. Ma'am, ma'am, run this way. Come on, we ain't gonna let him get you. Who are you? We fight for the Union. You're gonna be free. Just keep rowing. You're almost in the door now. Wow. Did they make it? They did, Claire. Though it was a close call, they landed in the free state of Illinois and settled there in the town of Quincy, where they got work in a tobacco factory. That's also where young Augustus Tolton met an Irish priest named Father Peter McGurr. Father McGurr let Gus, as he was called, become a student at the Catholic school there in Quincy, which didn't sit too well with some folks in the parish, though some were definitely in favor of it. As time passed, Gus spent more and more time around the parish. He not only attended school and mass there, but he helped out around the parish doing maintenance and cleaning. All the while, 
he felt more and more drawn to the sacraments and study of the faith. That sense of calling only grew. And, well, to fast forward a bit. Father McGear. Now, Russ, I don't know what to call me, Father Peter. And well, just listen to me. Your father, Russ, now. Your father told you. And you've just celebrated your first mass here in your own hometown. How about that? Father, it all seems so, so amazing. After all these years. All these years is right, my son. 24 years now it's been. 1862. When your dear mother first brought you and your family across the big river to freedom. Of course, it wasn't really total freedom, was it? I mean, there you was, a lad of just nine years old, working at a tobacco factory. The same year that President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation ending slavery. 1863. Even that factory was better than slavery. Father Ma- I mean, Father Peter. Ah, yeah, well, I suppose it were that, my son. And what, five years later, you were enrolled at St. Peter's School right here in Quincy, Illinois. I had the good fortune to give you your first Holy Communion and confirmation. I'm kind of proud of that, you know, if it ain't too much of a sin to be. Father, you were a good friend to me all along. All of us, actually. I remember when the white folks of the parish, who didn't want us up there, spoke up. You made sure we were welcome. Christ died for all, you would always say. Yes, and ain't it true, my son? That shut them up, didn't it? But you know, Gus, uh, Father Trotin, what little things it was that I done. What about you? Everything you and your people had to face. And you did it with strength and courage. And with wisdom. And smarts, too. I recollect that when finally we got you into St. Francis College in Quincy, they had to give you special instruction. You are so advanced beyond the other students. The white students. No, my son. If there's a hero to be found in these parts, it's our newest priest. But you never let me give up either, did you, Father Peter? When every seminary I applied to turned me down, you kept fighting for me. Till St. Francis took me. Ah, well, perhaps so. But then what is it now? More than six years ago. I'll never forget the day you departed for Rome. Nor will I, Father. Or the day I arrived and saw the seminary there. To be there, accepted and treated as a brother by my fellow seminarians. All of us studying for the priesthood. I'm, well, I'm ashamed to admit it. Father, but I was hard pressed to want to return to the United States after that. To come back to, well. To be hated, Gus. To be treated like a second class citizen at best. Ah, who can blame you? But you did come back to us. <laughs> well, I didn't expect to. Every moment leading up to my ordination, I reckoned on being sent as a missionary to Africa. I've been studying African languages and everything. There was no doubt in my mind, and my ordination. I'll never forget that day. April 24, 1886. At St. John Lateran Basilica in Rome. So... So beautiful, so holy. And the next day, to celebrate my first Mass ever at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, St. Peter's Father. And then, then when Cardinal Simeone, you know, the prefect of the congregation for the propagation of the faith, well, he pulled me aside and told me I wouldn't be going to Africa after all. Did I tell you what he said? No, Gus, the Father, Gus. What did he say? He said he felt the Holy Spirit had other plans. He said, America has been called the most enlightened nation. We shall see if it deserves the honor. Well, guess what do you think? Does it, my son? Well, I think there's a lot of work to be done here. That's for sure. Well, one thing I do know, guess. Yesterday, when you got off that train, after saying your first mass in America, in Hoboken, New Jersey, the first mass said by a black man from America, in America, the first black man to be ordained a priest in these United States. Well, there were thousands here to greet you. Thousands, Gus. And you at the head, Father. Ah, oh, Gus, this is about you. You made history, my son. And more importantly, you're changing hearts. You're changing the hearts of those who hate others, merely for the color of their skin. 
and you're changing hearts by the witness of your faith. That's a beautiful witness, Gus. You're just about the most faithful, dedicated servant of our Lord that I ever met. That's what you told everyone at the church a bit ago, in your home. Thank you for that, Father Peter. Father Tilton, all I did was tell them your story, and it isn't over yet. Kids, Father Tilton did continue to make a huge difference in Quincy, Illinois, but he also met with great opposition that only continued to grow. He also began to wonder if he could do more good serving African-American Catholics in Chicago, where a parish named St. Monica's, which was founded in the year 1882, will become the first church for African-Americans west of Baltimore. Hello? Is someone here? Yes, Father. Or should I say, son? Mama! I didn't expect to see you here. I see you praying. That's always a good thing. Yes, indeed. Just look at this place. I never cease to be amazed at this church, at St. Monica's, my son's own church. Yes, ma'am. It's been eight years now since I was assigned here to Chicago, to St. Monica's Parish. Eight hard years, Gus. Years of serving your parishioners here. And I know that hasn't been easy, even of traveling around the country, to answer speaking invitations. True. I wish I didn't have to do that. I mean, I'd rather serve my people here. There's so much need. But that money sure keeps the church doors open here at St. Monica's. Gus, you have admirers across this land. People of all colors come from miles around to hear you preach wherever you are. There are lots of folks who want to make sure this parish stays open, some to serve the needs to your parishioners. And there is great need, and some because they admire and love you. And so do I, you know. (sighs) Thank you, Mama. I love you too. Gus, your eyes are drooping even now. Look at you. Can't you go lay down and rest a little bit? Mama, there's just too much. Gus, even Jesus rested, went off by himself to pray. Gus, I'm worried about you. I've seen your health deteriorate. The good people of St. Monica's won't be helped if you get bad sick or worse. I know, Mom. I'll try. Maybe I'll just close my eyes now for a minute. You do that, son. I'll keep watch. I always have my Gus. Long ago in Missouri, crossing that big river, and ever since. I'll be watching and praying for you, Gus. I don't really like where this is headed. I mean, Father Tolton sounds kind of bad off. He was, Veronica. St. Monica's Church had a new building five years after Father Tolton arrived in 1894. And he was serving more and more people, traveling more and more to raise money for the parish, which was always struggling. He was preparing to call on several parishioners just before noon of July 10, 1897, during a great heat wave in Chicago. And several people saw him pass out from the heat and from exhaustion. He was taken to the hospital and died there a matter of hours later. He was just 43 years old. Father Tolton has been declared a servant of God because the cause for his being declared a saint is well on its way. I really expect he'll be named a saint, kids. Really? That's right, Ben. And there are others. One African saint who Father Tad didn't mention, probably because she's more recent, is St. Josephine Bakita, who died in 1947. And there are several African-American heroes whose cause for sainthood has been open besides Father Tolton. There's Mother Henriette Delisle, founders of the Sisters of the Holy Family in New Orleans. There's Mother Mary Elizabeth Lang, founders of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, Pierre Toussaint came from Haiti to New York as a slave, but used his eventual wealth to help others. Their sister, Thea Bauman, who did so much work for the Black Catholic community of America and beyond, who died in 1990. That's a lot. Listen, Ben, you be sure to tell your cousin about all of this. I don't know if it will change his mind, but these are stories more people should know. Don't you agree, kids? Mm Mm-hmm. Sure, yeah. Well, I definitely feel prouder, and I do want to talk to my cousin about all this, but in charity, I know. 